how excited are you to be on the podcast? Uh, are we rolling? Of course. I'm yeah, awesome. we're, of course we're going to roll. I'm, I'm, uh... no, Hi, everybody. Welcome to the pre accident Podcast. I'm the host of this here thing. My name's Todd Conklin, and how are you? Well, <clears throat> darn it. The summer is screaming down. I can't even believe. First, we talk about how excited I am the summer's coming. Then summer happens, and I'm totally into it. There's no question about it. And now, crap. Now I can kind of see the glint of fall. Although, to be fair, fall in New Mexico is el primo tiempo. It's a really good time to be in New Mexico because it smells good, and they're roasting chilies. And the mountains are all different colors, like red and gold and yellow and green, and that's nice. And you can still, you know, get your porch time in, if you know what I mean. The summer was an exciting summer. I'm sure the, I'd be just exciting as can be, and that's good. I mean, that keeps us healthy and young, and isn't that what it's all about? And adventures abound everywhere, so that's good as well. So as long as we got that going, I think we're covered. That's um, that's an interesting part of what happens. And we're uh, just screaming through podcasts. It's been, there's a lot of, um, I the, the next half of the year or whatever's left, four months of the year, um, there's some, I'm pretty excited about who's coming up on this podcast. I'm really excited actually about today because today's conversation, believe it or not, is with a uh, with James Newman. If you don't know James Newman, you should because he started a po- he had me know this. This is why this whole podcast started. If you want to know the, if you want to know why why James is on, this is it. He started his a, his Human Performance New View Safety podcast before I did, and he just wanted to tell me that and just break it off inside me. <laughs> yeah, I'm way ahead. Yep, he did, and he did six whole podcasts and he quit. So there. So. <laughs> You might have started early, but you quit way before me too, James. But James, um, he's he's uh, he's he's been well. There's just a lot going on here, so I, I can't wait for you to hear the conversation because there's tons going on. But we do, in fact, talk about his origin story and the origin podcast story because I found that interesting. I don't know if you will, but uh, that's the ride you're on, and uh, it's a great conversation. We had lots of fun. It was is really fun to talk to him. Actually, I think you'll you'll enjoy it immensely. All is well from my side. Uh, just a lot of tremendous amount of uh, just fun being had, squeezing in as much fun as I possibly can. Um, because that, my new goal, I'm almost certain next year's New Year's resolution, I'm really feeling it, is going to be I'm going to have as much damn fun as I can possibly have. That is the goal. I'm going to just stop doing stuff I don't want to do. So there. So if I don't call you anymore, you kind of know where you fit in the scheme of things, you know, because there's basically, well, you know, there's two kinds of people. Um, there's the people you can't wait to see and then the people you can't wait to not see. And you should be able to name both of those people. And if you can't name the second one, you should be worried because it might be you. You might be the person that nobody wants to see in your workplace, but probably not because only hip cats The hip cats are the kind of people that listen to this podcast. So as long as you're listening to this, suffice it to say you're on the good side of that equation. I'm also having this incredible urge right now that I almost can't get over for peanut butter cookies. I don't know where this comes from, but you can't. I mean, I'm going to have to probably create an environment where peanut butter cookies are being made. That is what's going to happen next. I can almost, I can feel it happening kind of. That urge is there. And it's right on the edge, and that is going to happen. So there you go. So that's that's the news. But until then, while I'm making peanut butter cookies, why don't you sit back and listen to uh, James Newman? He's from, his organization is called, what is it called? I can't remember what it's called. It's called humanperformancetools.com, I think is what it's called. Yeah, humanperformancetools.com. And, and James does a lot of, um, human performance work, James and Kristen do a lot of human performance works really around the globe. And they sort of focus on d- dynamic learning activities, um, activities to make it go. And he's got a little podcast. So it should be, it should be very interesting to hear what has to happen next. So sit back and relax to James and I talk about 
Well, it's a it's a podcast war. It's a podcast off. You'll enjoy it. So here we are. This is uh this is the conversation with James. Good. Okay, so what, what, why do you want to be on the podcast? What's wrong with you? Are oh, you, are oh, you in trouble? Are you a... mentally ill? <laughs> so in 2013, I thought it'd be a really cool idea to have a human performance uh, web. Oh, I should say webcast a uh, podcast. And podcasting was just starting to get uh, exciting and interesting. Uh, my biggest problem, I was uh, uh, almost literally in the, the dead center of the country, and I felt like I didn't have a lot of people I could talk to about podcasting. So I actually hired a podcasting consultant to help me understand how to do everything. Oh, there, there are podcasting consultants? There was at the time. What do they wear? <laughs> well, they, like yeah, used they, car salesmen? Do yeah, they have like a actually, shiny suit? It's so funny that you said it because the guy actually used to be uh, a used car salesman. He was out of Cleveland. And um, he taught me a lot, and uh, I paid him, of course. What did he teach you? Well, they, they teach you about, uh, like, one of the really cool things to do when you're podcasting is to stand up. People can't see it, but it gives you a little bit of activeness in your, uh, in your speech. It, it's just a really subtle thing. And that's uh, a, so they do tips and tricks like that. So all the behind-the-scenes stuff that sometimes people that work behind the microphone, uh, they already kind of know this stuff. So that's, you know, lessons learned. So benchmark. I worked in radio. You worked in radio. Not you necessarily a, radio. No, I was a wedding you, DJ. Sorry. Oh, really? Yeah. I was in radio. So we had a standing board. So oh. we always stood up when we were at work. All right. See, that's a really interesting yeah, technique, I right? I don't know if it made your voice more active or not. But it makes you stand up, which I guess <laughs> engages you differently. But yeah, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, perhaps it was just a list of things that he tells all his clients. You know, because uh, what are you paying him for, right? That kind of thing. But he also gave me some ideas of uh, transitions, like when you're going to go maybe from one speaker that you're interviewing to another. If you have a whole bunch in the same podcast, you want to transition a little bit of music or something like that, um, or if you're thinking about the show ahead of time, so it's not so random. Like you have a certain. Um, almost like an outline, and you have a format to your show. Intro music, outro music's a little different, but similar. Things like that. It just got me thinking about all that stuff. Mm. And, I, and I appreciated that. And that uh, was 2013. Yeah, 2013. Which and is almost, what, six, seven years ago? It was, uh, it was exactly six years ago. So last you were ahead month. of me. Your podcast started before my podcast started. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you're really a trailblazer. I, well, you know, Impo thought so. So how many listeners do you have now? <laughs> All right, let's let me talk about that real quick. Um, I put out six episodes, had almost zero feedback. I had some feedback from friends that said, hey, it's really cool, you know. And uh, um, I just had no real feedback from listeners because I don't think I was reaching anybody. And I, I certainly at the time I had just started uh, blogging. Uh, and I was advertising that I was podcasting at the time, and it just it just wasn't enough. It felt like a lot of extra work, and I wasn't getting anything from it. No, at the time, also, I wasn't a consultant. I was working in-house as a human performance lead at a nuclear plant, and this was just something I was doing on my own. I wanted to get better at human performance, that that, and I thought this would be a really cool way to do it. Uh, and, and so the format basically was to talk to other people, kind of like you do, talk to other people about human performance, what are they learning, what's working, what's not working. Uh, let's discuss these concepts and kind of think about this in a new way. That's so, very cool. And, and then another, uh, I, had, I had three different kind of guests. One was uh, people that, you know, peers. The other one was uh, business owners and find out what's really exciting from an owner point of view and how they're doing error prevention, you know, the detection, prevention, correction kind of uh, uh, questions. And then the other one was uh, uh, finding people with really interesting jobs or interesting people. Like, like we have, I had talked to you about uh, like an elderly blind woman. Um, I, I did that whole podcast and I never published it, you know, uh, bad on me. I, I still have to do that. I still have it. But uh, I interviewed a high stakes um, uh a dealer at oh, a, a casino, yeah, uh, and how you know how they're trained to not make mistakes and all that stuff, and it was really interesting to me. I didn't know if this was going to translate to anybody else, but I thought the more interesting the job was, the more people would want to listen. And uh, so I, I I did interview uh, somebody who works at big pharmacy and uh, they're in the safety assessment group, and that one was really awesome. It's one of my favorites. That one is published, uh, and then a, a hair salon owner. And uh, she was really animated and really was comparing some of the things I was doing in nuclear to the things she was doing uh, with her salon. And, uh, and then I just, uh, uh, life happened and it really got in the way 
of uh, more podcasts. And uh, of course, I haven't stopped listening to them since then. My 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 favorite, of course, I, I like yours. As a matter of fact, yours is advertised on my website. Oh, thank you. No problem. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, it's really all, all the newest ones are in the top left corner. You you go to humanperformancetools dot com, and there it is. There it is. So, so introduce yourself. Sure. Who are you? Uh, what do you do? You. All right. I'm uh, James Newman. I Started Human Performance Tools uh, as a consulting and training company a couple of years ago, and I'm just uh, uh, having a blast, absolute blast, uh, helping companies out, whether it's doing an assessment of their human performance program, uh, giving them some guidance, or uh, giving them training, helping them along the way, letting them know from a consultant point of view what seems to be going right, what seems to be going wrong. And giving them some advice that they might not get any other way, which is really cool. Uh, and uh, also, once in a while, get to go to conferences and uh, do presentations, you know, and is talk to thought get leaders. Get to go to conferences or have to go to conferences? No, for me, it, nice. it's always been get to go. Nice. I, I absolutely have uh, – um, I love conferences. I, I love networking. I love uh, talking to people and uh, really – Helping me become a better uh, trainer, really, at the end of the day. So what have you learned this conference? Oh, oh that's a, such a great question. Um, well, today opened my eyes a little bit. Oh, really? Bit You've got your notes out? This is impressive. I, I, uh, yeah. Well, I had them with me. Um, today, I like, um, let's see, I wrote this down. Uh, What's happening when nothing bad is happening? Uh, the classic uh, Eric Honnickel. Yeah. yeah I, isn't that I, great? I, I had never, like, considered that. You know, that's a really cool thing. And then uh, shift your thinking from who failed to what failed. I, I kind of already had that concept. But right. um, let's see. Uh, some of the black line and blue line stuff. And uh, if you want something different, you have to do something different, which seems so darn obvious. But um, my favorite quote from you has always been that safety, and I always include human performance in this, is not about the absence of events. It's about the presence of defenses, or or uh, today we talked about capacity right. and the capacity of human resilience. Oh, man, it just, uh, uh, it's an eloquent way of saying defenses. I, I love that. And, uh, um, uh, of course, as risk goes up, tools and controls go up. As risk goes down, tools and controls go down. I, I would, uh, as a trainer... Even as a consultant, I would say not everybody in your organization needs this stuff. I feel like you have to start – this is just my personal opinion here. Uh, if you think about what are the worst kind of events that this organization can have and work backwards from that and say, right, how can we prevent those things from happening? And then you could – because that, that to me is what you were talking about. You look at the system first and work your way back right. towards the people. It's, it's hard, though, because as complexity increases – and as technology increases, the number of ways we can have catastrophic failure becomes really, 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 really big. And so there are more ways to fail than we could probably imagine. So it's that, and that makes risk assessment, hazard assessment difficult. Sure. Because sure. the things, the hazards that hurt people are almost always not the hazards we've identified, because we've identified those. They're almost always the hazards that we didn't identify, that we didn't imagine, that drifted into the system. Those are the ones that kind of scare people. Yeah, I, I do love the concept of drift. Uh, and, and somebody said, uh, uh, so you're familiar with just DOE definition of, um, uh, we talk about violations, error, uh, mm -hmm. latent, active, that kind of thing. Um, when we look at violations, why do people violate? And, you know, a lot of times it's for convenience or, or what's accepted, that kind of thing. But what drift is, is the allowance of violation. Could be. I mean, that's a way to look at it. I, I would go back and tell you that if you believe the world is too valued, there's either doing it right or doing it wrong, mm -hmm. doing work or violating work, you're missing kind of the area in between. And that's if there's mistakes and violation, then the space between that is probably intentional variance, where workers will intentionally vary a process. They know it's not the way to do it, but in this case, for this reason, for this context, this makes the most sense to do it this way. But isn't that what – see, all right, so there's another part of it. That's what drift is unless you change the standard, and then that becomes okay. Yeah, but think of drift as kind of natural. So if work ebbs and flows and hazards are dynamic, they're constantly in motion, mm -hmm. then what happens is the work drifts away from the imagined state, the way it's uh, imagined it would be done. Sure. It drifts to the place where you're actually doing the work, and and that happens 
over time and quite naturally. So it's hard to identify drift, right? Um, the question I ask all the time, and it's one to think about, is what's the difference between problem solving and shortcutting? Right? Well, the, the answer is going to be outcome, right? Okay. A shortcut's got a negative outcome uh, or negative consequence. Problem solving probably has a positive outcome. You fix the problem. But in fact, both of them are forms of drift. They both, like when you're problem solving, when, you, when you're exposed to something you didn't expect you would see, so you open up a container and there's something there that you didn't expect, mm -hmm. our world wants to say you should stop, reevaluate, replan, re-strategize, rethink the work, re-identify the hazards, right? And then start again with all this new information. But the world in which we do work says, you say, huh, that's weird. I guess I'm going to need a Phillips head screwdriver and not a flathead <laughs> screwdriver. Right? And you don't see that as, as consequential because mostly that kind of surprise condition isn't consequential. Mostly what it is is kind of normal work. That's what I would call direct. But I would have less influence on, less influence on the worker per se. Or, or less influence on leadership allowing the worker to drift per se mm -hmm. and more... Uh, interest in variability and complexity. That's what I would look at. I mean, I don't know if I'm right or not. I, I never <laughs> said I was right. Well, I think you, you had said, and I wrote this down, the solution for complexity is transparency. Well, that's that's probably always true. Yeah. What we do best is take those transparent, those complex couplings and make them known. You could also call it disambiguating, okay. but I think that's a little snooty. I, uh, speaking of snooty, uh, I, I and came we from, were, and, I, and by the way, we were. Well, I came from uh, nuclear power, where yes, uh, the snootiest I, of all, right? They don't even use the word human performance anymore. Did you know this? Ampos now switched it to calling it operational excellence. Oh which, yes, I've seen that. Well, so now there's two OE. It's confusing. There's operating experience, experience and yeah. operating excellence. Sometimes I don't think Impo thinks very much. <laughs> I mean, am I right? It doesn't seem like they think these. Uh, uh, well. Um, I always tried to approach um, Impo with recognizing that they're trying to do it excellence. Like, they're always seeking excellence. And I can get on board with that, you know. Uh, you like excellence. I do. Oh, I do like the pursuit of it. You right. know, um, I, I feel like that's a real important thing. All right. So, um, after 15 years as an INC tech, I got uh, offered uh, an opportunity to, you know, be the site lead at the plant I was at for human performance. And... I had weaseled my way, that's the right word, to weaseled my way into two HPRCTs uh, as a technician. So when was this? To, uh, 19, I think it was 98. So th was that back when they were in Monterey? This was in Kansas City. Do you remember when they had them in Monterey a bunch of times? I uh, unfortunately never got to go well, there. Because was, was uh, that was a really expensive Oh, travel, okay. Right? But. Well, um, I got the site vice president to say it was okay for me to go. So I got to go to the Kansas City one. It's either 98 or 99. And then in uh, 2000... I wasn't born yet. That's yeah, how, that's, sure. That's yeah, of course. Were. In 2002 or three, it was at um, Mystic Marriott in Connecticut. And um, the guy who put it on, Alex House, I don't know if you ever met Alex. Um, I totally know that name. All right. He, um, he asked if I could be their DJ, like their, their audio guy, because he knew I wanted to go. But I wasn't a human performance guy. He knew I was totally dedicated and loved this stuff. And uh, so he got the site vice president to call my boss and says, hey, let him go. He's going to help us out. And it was just uh, uh, I got an hour with Cindy Decker. And it was the first time I even met him. I mean, even knew of the guy. I got an hour with him in the hallway. And we just talked human performance. And I was like, oh, my gosh, I love this stuff. And then um, – uh, you know, you, you have those times in your career, you're like, oh, my gosh, I know what I want to do for uh, a living, but now I'm a technician. And once you're a qualified tech, they don't want you to stop being qualified tech because it takes a while to oh, get yeah, there. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it took Big me a long time. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I started in 92, and it took me all the way to 2007 to uh, get into human performance full time. But I had I was running the human performance uh, – I was the, the human performance chair. Like, we, I created committees. And so, oh, my gosh, it was so cool. So we were trying to proactively. Uh, when did you go out on your own? Um, just two years ago. What made you do it? 
Um, well, one, it's something I've always loved to do, but that's a really great question. Um, it seems brave, kind of. Oh, my gosh. I feel like I'm a little too young to do this yet. You know, like I should probably be working for somebody else. But um, it was a uh, – basically, you know, you have competing um, priorities in your life. And my number one priority was wanting to spend more time with the kids. And when you work for the man, right, you're you're working 40 to 60 hours, you know, and then especially in nuclear, you got refueling outages. That, that takes a lot of your time away from your family. And uh, I felt like I was moving into a place where I might be able to still um, uh, work 40 or less hours a week, spend more time with the kids, and still do what I love. And just uh, through a series of just, oh, my gosh, like uh, dreams coming true, I suppose, uh the phone kept ringing uh say hey can you come out and give us some training can you come out and do this can you come out and do this i'm like i started thinking how did all this happen like how are these people finding me and uh so i I talked to a a marketing friend of mine and he said well what you're doing is what's called uh uh, inbound marketing i said i've never even heard this term before and he says well you know you have your your blog he said what you should do is turn it into like a business site like you know turn it into a business site now that you're doing these gigs, and then I was doing so many gigs, I got to you know quit the other work I was doing, which at the time was training development. So, um, the company I was working for was so amazing; they let me take you know time with no pay to go do these gigs and then come back and work with them. And it was helpful that you know we got ahead of uh, uh, all the work we were doing, so we were in a good place to let me go. Yeah. Uh, but it was a win-win situation set up, and then it just turned into. Uh, so many clients it's time to go ahead and pull the trigger and say sorry i can't work here anymore um i'm finally doing what i want to do and that that's kind of how it happened it was definitely on purpose but it wouldn't have happened without a lot of luck and a lot of thinking about this back in 2013 what's your fundamentals class look like oh i love that all right so um okay throw down here we go there we go yeah hold uh, on buckle up <laughs> buttercup i talk about principles right uh well first uh uh, NFPA 70 Echo got revised uh, right. a couple of Januarys ago. Right. And when I saw the revision uh, to include human performance, I was like, all this stuff is in my fundamentals class. I don't have to change anything. So if you go to 70 Echo, that's pretty much the stuff that's in there. Uh, my, one of my favorite things to talk about is performance modes. Uh, so I, I do like talking about that. I like to think that I can train people so they know performance modes cold in like 15 minutes or less. God, that's a miracle. It's, it's, it's very it difficult. It takes me an hour just to talk about the stupid slide. <laughs> it does. I approach it using, uh, using games. Uh, in the games as we were when we were ch- children. And, uh, you know, the first time you played the game, uh, how, how, how well you were at it. And somebody told you, well, you could do it better this way, that kind of thing. And then you do it enough where you don't have to think about it. You just, you know, play it. That, that, that to me, you know, move you through the three modes really quick. And then we talk about the modes. Um, and the, the GPS, by the way, is the absolute 100% easiest way to describe rule base because you're following rules. And then what if it tells you to go down a one way, the wrong way, you still have to be smarter than the rules. Right. Cause the map is not the terrain. That's right. The GPS is not the road. Right. So you still have to be smarter than the guidance. Uh, and I think that's a really cool way to look at rule-based mode. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting phenomenon. Yeah. And, and you know what? It's what's so cool. Um, do you know who Dana Cooley is? Mm, no, oh, tell oh, me. He's a, a Eon C State. I don't know if he's still doing it. They used to do uh, causal investigations, but he's actually uh, interviewed on uh, one of my podcasts. And uh, One of the six. One of the six. He's you one of the six. Speak of your podcasts as if there are many. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in you're, case, you're dangerously close to talking about all six of them. Oh, there, that's right? right. That's true. And then what will you do? Oh, my gosh. In case you don't know, uh, Todd's trying to goad me into bringing the podcast back. So, more is uh, better. More is more better. better. Yeah, I love it. Um, and that was actually – so here's something I learned a long time ago. If there's a need and nobody's filling it, fill it yourself, you know, uh, and and that's what that's what I did. And, and then uh, when I stopped doing it uh, a couple of years later, there you go. You, you know, your podcast. And then so you like, started in you said 2013. 2013? Yeah, May. And I would have started in probably 2014, yeah. It wasn't that long after. Because I've been doing them five years, I think. It's pretty impressive. I'll tell you to keep with it. Um, it's, to me, it's way more impressive to keep with it than just doing six. I'm like, it, God. I think it gets easier. 
I think, uh, yeah. I see. Well, you got a lot of microphones. What I ended up well, doing. Well, that's I, so I don't normally. Um, <laughs> I would normally not carry even like one tenth of this stuff. You just, but so I, wanna, I just carry the digital recorder, right? Yeah, I want to uh, see if I can um, get a couple other people since we're here. It's a great opportunity, right? So I absolutely, up, and I, I kind of like the idea of a lot of people on one podcast, yeah, at the same time. Yeah, a little little teams. A little going to be a little difficult for the listeners to decipher who's talking. They'll do, but they'll do fine. <laughs> Never underestimate the people that listen. Oh no, no, they're, I, they're smarter than you are. Oh, I, hands down, hands down. So let me ask this question because sure. it's a good one. Please, what what is it that you bring to the world that you're especially good at in in the human performance space in in the resilience reliability space? Okay, so um, I would like to start by saying as an INC tech. I would look at the, a plant in, in a different way than maybe somebody who wasn't an INC tech. So sure. I feel like when I talk about human performance, I mean, I used it. I'm not just talking about it as somebody who thinks it's a good idea. I, I didn't get on the wrong equipment. You know, I never started a safety system, you know, I, I uh, an accident. You know, uh, um, I put these things in into place and uh, had had positive outcomes. So I, and I, and I had a, we'll say a, a uh, lucky, uh, you know, I don't know that uh, it was definitely on purpose. So I hate saying lucky's on purpose, but I had a good career as an INC tech. And uh, um, it depends what you think about being fortunate. It yeah, depends, yeah, it really goes to the fact that do you have free agency as a human being or are you predetermined? But th- we probably won't solve that today. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But okay, so um, I realized it, it took me a while to realize. I mean, my first school was nuclear engineering, um, my second school when I went back to college was workforce education development. I was more interested in the grays than I was the black and whites. It took me a long time to realize that about myself. Uh, And then when I realized that, I just full tilt towards how do adults learn? And that's where my head is, you know. And uh, so um, in college, studying the taxonomies, right, of uh, head, heart, and hands, really. And, And then realizing that as a tech, all the training, we get a lot of training as a technician, all the training that I had ever had, was in the knowledge realm and in the skills realm. None of it was heart. You know, the only thing, and you probably heard this before, the only thing that they would ever talk to us about, sometimes they would start the class with the WIFM. You familiar with uh-huh. the WIFM? What's in it for me? Yeah. Which is very different than WTF. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> so um, the, the WIFM was like the only affective piece of the training. Um, I feel like, especially when it's a, a, a behavior thing, when you're going to be talking to uh, people or asking them to do, even leadership, asking them to do something different, you have to think effective all the time, not just in your opening slide or not, you know, as you're doing your presentation. So um, really paying attention and talking to a lot of colleagues about we need to help with effective objectives in the training as well, not just these knowledge and skill. And, and which brings us back all the way to HR. You, we heard it yesterday in one of the trainings. They talk about knowledge, skill, and abilities. It wasn't abilities. It used to be knowledge, skill, and attitudes. And then somewhere along the line, it got shifted into abilities. And I, and I wholeheartedly believe, as an instructor, it's very difficult to teach effective. It's way easier to say, well, uh, can we move that into the ability realm? And right. Because truly, what's the difference between a skill and an ability? Can none. somebody sort none. that out? I feel it's the same exact thing. There's no difference. Right. So when we say KSAs, and it just rolls off our tongue, especially in the HR world, uh, the KSAs to do this this task or the KSAs, what they really mean is knowledge, skill, and attitude, not knowledge, skill, and abilities. And and, and remembering that that attitude is all very important. Uh, so uh, spreading that message is certainly important to me and understanding how adults learn um, is very important to me. But one of the things that I, I love, and I try to drive this into all the training I've ever created, um, is some type of activity or, or game to make this feel real. And uh, because if I just tell you a concept or tell you an idea without making it feel real to you, you're going to forget that, you know. Uh, And that's not good enough for me. I want you to walk out of this training and and have a different, I mean, if it's that important, you know, I have a different perception of this. So you might actually think, hey, you know what, this is cool. If you could teach somebody and get their hearts in it so they value something, you almost don't even need the, the, the knowledge and the skill stuff. They'll go look at look for, for themselves. Yeah, they'll learn. So teach a, buy a person a fish, teach a person a fish, right? It's a, yeah. So how do people contact you? 
Oh, well, uh, humanperformancetools.com, uh, james at humanperformancetools.com. That works. That's uh, easy. Humanperformancetools.com. It, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was, uh, and that's, I guess, maybe the benefit of starting this stuff uh, six years ago. Um, the domain was open. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the reason my email is Todd Conklin at Gmail. That's right. But yeah, because my, well, I was an early adopter. There you go. Gmail, that's that's right. It's very important. Well, thanks for your time, James. This was really fun. Absolutely. I I, uh, I love listening to it. Is so, I'm so happy and jazzed to just be uh, well, having a chat. We'll with you. We'll listen to your podcast as soon as you. Oh uh, no. <laughs> revitalize it. Revitalize. Thank you. It. Start the, the with episode new. seven. The all new. <laughs> the all new Even for Tools podcast. Thanks, brother. All right. Thank you. Todd. Later. I like talking to James. He's got a happy voice. He's kind of a happy dude. Uh, but just in case you're wondering, we were sitting. We were not standing in that podcast because, I don't know, we could stand. I've stood my whole career. I'm standing now, so shut up, okay? Uh, that's kind of how it works. But it was. it's fun to talk to him. It's fun to talk about the journey. It's really fun to talk about practitioners as they move out. And, and he's busy, too. He's He's out there in the world making a difference just like you are. And so that's good. That's a really good thing. And I like how he's trying to attach learning to action and application because I think that's really valuable. And it's easy to talk about theory. No, that's, let me take that back. I don't know if it's easy to talk about theory. Talking about theory is very different than talking about application. But it all has to coexist. It's all part of the same trip. So there we go. So that's James's podcast, Human Performance Guy. The, you know, early adopter podcaster guy. Let's see if we put any fire underneath him. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll have a new podcast out there, and we can all listen to that, and that'll be fun. Until then, my friends, learn something new every single day. Have as much fun as you possibly can. And for goodness sakes, stand up and be safe. <laughs>